Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion S5M15186 in the name of Colin Beattie on celebrating the reach of adult learning. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. You can ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak now. And I call on Colin Beattie to open the debate. Mr Beattie, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to introduce the first ever debate on the reach of adult learning into Scotland's disadvantaged communities. I'd like to congratulate, firstly, Midlothian Council's Lifelong Learning and Employability Service and Melville Housing for their joint adult learning project. Of course, I'm particularly pleased to highlight this project because not only is it running in my own constituency, but I think it illustrates just how educational interventions like this can change people's lives. I know from colleagues in the Parliament that there are many great examples of adult learning across the country. And I think it's time, timely now to discuss this in what can be seen as a year of celebration for adult learning in Scotland, as well as in the Scottish Parliament. Significantly, this year we will mark the centenary of a revolutionary milestone in the history of adult education in the UK, and indeed internationally. And that's the publication of the final report of the Adult Education Committee of the Ministry of Reconstruction, better known as the 1919 report. This report represented a hugely important statement of the value of adult education and its role in creating and sustaining successful democratic societies animated by shared civic, social and economic goals. It not only, it not, not only recognized the wide impact adult education can have on society, notably in responding to the massive social, economic and political challenges of the time, but also accorded national and local government a direct responsibility for ensuring its adequate supply. Adult education, the 1919 report argued, is not a luxury, but is in fact indispensable to national recovery and to sustainable, effective democracy. It also emphasized the social purpose of adult education in supporting enlightened and responsible citizenship and in creating a well-ordered welfare state organized around the common good. The goal of all education in 1919 included the advancement of citizenship it promoted an understanding that access to adult learning was a right, and that each individual had responsibilities as a skilled member of the community to help meet local needs and reduce disadvantage. The report, the report also argued that the main political, social and economic challenges faced by the country could only be tackled with the help of a greatly expanded, publicly funded system of adult education. In 1919, it was decided that adult education must not be regarded as a luxury for a few exceptional persons, nor as a thing which concerned only a short span of early man or womanhood. Rather, it's a permanent national necessity, an inseparable aspect of citizenship, and therefore should be both universal and lifelong. The report stated, the opportunity for adult education should be spread uniformly and systematically over the whole community as a primary obligation on that community in its own interest, and as a chief part of its duty to its individual members. Every encouragement and assistance was to be given to voluntary organizations so that their work may be developed and find its proper place in the national education system. That report laid the foundation for what became a publicly funded adult education sector, where local education authorities were encouraged to see non-vocational adult education as an integral part of the activities. The report recognized that all men and women had the capacity to participate in a humane, liberal education and to contribute to the democratic life of the country. It also saw that different approaches to teaching and organization were required for adults. Emphasizing both the realities of their lives and the breadth of their interests, along with their need for the fullest self-determination in their lending. 100 years later, the Scottish government has been laying the foundation for a strong culture of community learning that helps build individual and social capacity. The strategic guidance to community planning partnerships, the Scotland CLD regulations, and the Community Empowerment Scotland Act are the keystones that support community-based learning and see the power for change rooted in and flowing from Scotland's residents. Between 1919 and 1945, each education authority was responsible for ensuring the delivery of adult learning and worked closely with the voluntary sector and universities for support. It wasn't until 1975, with the publication of Adult Education, The Challenge of Change, and the reorganization of local government, that we saw the emergence of, emer emergence of discrete community education services, 
where adult education, youth work and community work were brought together in order to target in these disadvantaged groups. And these three strands of work now form the three national priorities for all community learning and development providers in Scotland. For much of the next 25 years, a shifted focus to community-based adult learning enabled individuals and groups in local communities to participate in the widest possible range of education and or training opportunities. The report, Communities Change Through Learning, was published in 1998 and focused on the development of a national strategy for community-based adult education, youth work, and educational support for community development. These developments have focused on social inclusion and lifelong learning. And the acceptance of this report's recommendations resulted in the Scottish Office guidance of April 1999, providing direction to local authorities on the provision of community education. It also detailed their requirement to produce community learning strategies with their partners. With the establishment of the Scottish Parliament in 1999 and the Partnership for Scotland, an agreement for the first Scottish Parliament, which set out government priorities for Scotland, including the development of an enterprise economy through investing in jobs and skills, adult learning was seen as key to achieving these goals, and it began to add a focus on literacy, numeracy, and employability in its programme. The Scottish Government is working with others, including the National Strategic Forum for Adult Learning, to develop a strategy for this in Scotland. Initial consultations with adult learning providers and learners have taken place. Hearing directly from learners helps us to empower communities and remember that education has a purpose outside of solely promoting skills growth. Our predecessors in 1919 recognised that education had relevance to people's livelihoods, success and to the nation's prosperity. Further, they were just as concerned with values, citizenship, the nature of a good society and the intrinsic benefits of learning. The infrastructure of adult education has increasingly been challenged and all at a time when the challenges posed by changes in technology, climate, demography and politics would seem to demand much more adult educa education, not less. The centenary of the 1919 Adult Education Report provides a much needed moment for introspection and reflection on what we think adult education is for and why we value it. It's an opportunity to put adult education once again in the spotlight to recognise the importance of thoughtful civic engagement through citizenship and to show how adult education can help us renew our democracy and become a kinder, smarter and more cohesively open and prosperous society. In conclusion, the Scottish Government has made a good start introducing guidance and legislation to promote community engagement and empowerment. And I look forward to hearing from the Minister how we can now go forward by resourcing community learning to give districts across Scotland the ability to deliver an education that meets the aspirations and needs of communities, of geography or of interest, especially those where a reduction in disadvantage can be delivered most effectively by those who understand how to challenge it best. Thank you very much, Mr. Beattie. I now call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Mr. Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And let me just start by apologising to you, uh, the people in the public gallery, and colleagues here, uh, as the Rural Committee has a meeting in Gala Shields tonight. And after I've spoken, I will depart to catch a train uh, to get, uh, get me there on time. Uh, I'm sure it will be an entertaining and interesting debate. And let me also thank Colin uh, Beatty for giving us the opportunity to discuss uh, this very important topic. And indeed, my intern, uh, Bella in Ewan, uh, who has uh, done the research and written my speaking notes for me. It's always a challenge for somebody when they come to the uh, parliament uh, to be invited to look at a policy area they've never looked at and to come up with something. And it's always quite revealing uh, how quickly they can find that we're doing uh, quite a lot. The uh, important point is, of course, that we all say that Scotland aspires to be a welcoming and inclusive country for all. And part of that is ensuring that adults in Scotland have a good social network and support. But there are many who continue to experience a severe a social exclusion. So in particular, uh, the emphasis in the motion that's before us on the developing social networks is a very welcome thing. 
Uh, the NHS uh, report on social isolation and loneliness uh, talks about uh, those who are particularly at risk as being children and adults in socially economically disadvantaged and those experiencing physical and mental health uh, that is below uh, the norm. And of course, there's a whole set of stigmas associated with isolation, with low income, with people with disabilities. So any initiatives that we can take that help people develop a better sense of themselves, which they should properly have because we value everyone in our society, but also equipping them uh, to develop uh, relationships that will be lifelong and beneficial to them. It's uh, interesting too when you look at the Scottish Household uh, Survey, 8% uh, of respondents disagreed that they could turn to friends and relatives in the neighbourhood uh, for advice or support. So that gives us some measure of the problem, perhaps bigger than we might have imagined. And 18% of people reported they'd limited regular social contact in their neighbourhood. And that leads, according to other research, uh, to health issues, sometimes readily measurable ones like high blood pressure, poor sleep, depression, uh, but more fundamentally uh, about uh, mental health, which can be more insidious, particularly at low levels where it's subclinical, help is not sought, the need to uh, seek help is not necessarily recognised. So we need to reach out to this category of individuals in particular and make sure that there's a wide range of opportunities uh, for them to participate in the whole range of things that most of society uh, take for granted. And through that participation, of course, improve their social contact with others and allow others to see opportunities in supporting uh, such people in the long term. Technology is uh, adding to the problem rather than being a solution in the problem in many instances. Because if you don't have the skills and incentive and indeed the equipment uh, to engage in the modern digital world, you are further isolated. So I think the focus on ensuring that people have the ability to develop online and digital communication skills is equally important. And our libraries, our public spaces are often a very good place in which we can do that. I'll just close by saying in Bamshire and Buck and Coast, my constituency, the Community Learning and Development team as are hosting small group sessions to address this issue. That's part of a wider national picture of activity that I very much welcome. Big opportunities, a lot to do, but we're making good progress. Presiding officer, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevenson. I now call Gordon Lindhurst, followed by Mary Fee. Mr. Lindhurst, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would also like to begin by thanking Colin Beattie for raising awareness about the Digital Kitchen Workshop in Midlothian uh, in the, his motion in this debate. Um, it is a, a timely initiative which appears to suit the twin needs we now have as a technology-driven society, but one which also has problems with food. We are, of course, surrounded by technology in everything we do, as has already been said. Whether we're looking to find out basic information like shop opening times or applying for a job through an online portal, technology is there. And not having the access or the skills required to use that technology self-evidently puts people at a basic disadvantage. A citizen's advice survey last year in Scotland of 1,200 of its clients found that 18% never used the internet. So that is almost one-fifth of people, particularly adults, left behind as younger generations take the technology they use for granted as they grow up with it all around them. That one-fifth figure is significant also for other reasons. In 2016, only one-fifth of adults in Scotland consumed the recommended five portions of fruit and vegetables in the previous day. Uh, I have to confess, I don't think I've eaten my proper amount of proportion or portions today myself, but um, that was a significant decrease from 23% in 2009. And as a result of this, we we're face, uh, facing a worsening obesity and diabetes crisis. For those who have the skills, cooking may feel like a rather simple exercise, something that allows them to use healthy food in interesting and tasty ways. 
But others who don't find it that way will have to resort to more unhealthy options, or feel they do, which are often more expensive, even if they're easier to buy and more conveniently available. So bringing adults together in a surrounding where they can develop digital skills and learn how to cook healthy and affordable meals is therefore an excellent use of finite time and resources and a model to be used elsewhere. The workshop reminds me of a similar housing association initiative that I visited uh, towards the beginning of my time as an MSP. The Clovey Community Garden in Clovenstone run jointly between Prospect Community Housing and Edible Estates brings people in the community together to grow an impressive variety of fruits and vegetables in the heart of Edinburgh. Produce which is then used in a series of cooking classes organized to make tasty and cheap meals. I can say firsthand that the potatoes I was treated to uh, were extremely good from the garden patch there. What pleased me, however, most was the way in which the garden and the workshops clearly brought the community together and taught them some valuable life skills. These are, as Colin Beatty has pointed out, especially important in areas of disadvantage. Deputy Presiding Officer, I note that the Midlothian Learning and Development three-year plan for 2018 to 21 highlights that an area for improvement is in community empowerment relating to food growing. Perhaps the next step for the digital kitchen workshop could be to replicate the Clovey community garden and grow the food too. While I am sure that other parts of the country can learn from the good work being done in Midlothian, let me end by thanking everyone who gives up their time in community-based adult learning. I hope today's debate helps to show how much this work is appreciated and how important it is. Thank you very much, Mr Linders. I call Mary Fee, and then I'll go to the Minister. Ms Fee, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I, too, begin by thanking Colin Beatty for securing this member's debate and wish the partnership between Midlothian Council's Lifelong Learning and Employability Service and Melville Housing every success. The opportunity for lifelong learning must be universal and fundamental to improving the lives of people across Scotland. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that Everyone has the right to education. Investment in lifelong learning for adults must be seen as preventative spend, particularly in areas involving adult literacy and numeracy, tackling digital access and in social isolation. And unfortunately, Deputy Presiding Officer, in this age of austerity, cuts to education affect the opportunity to learning for people of all ages. And the financial settlements for local authorities will deliver real terms cuts to budgets, as they have done in recent years. And if we do want to be proactive in supporting adults to learn, particularly those with the poorest literacy or numeracy skills, or those from the most disadvantaged backgrounds and communities, then we need to recognise that local authority budget cuts will limit how proactive we can be. Reaching out and engaging with adults who could benefit from programmes, such as that in Midlothian, is a difficult task, and cross-agency partnerships are a key to overcoming that barrier. Community learning and development has a key role in helping people from disadvantaged and vulnerable groups to access learning and prepare for study and employment. Engaging with adults in their own communities limits the barriers or the fears that some may face when thinking about education. And many of those we talk about have no qualifications and no post-school education. So creating a safe place to learn is crucial to that engagement. And Deputy Presiding Officer, although the aim for adult learning is rightly focused on some of our most disadvantaged people, ensuring that some of our smaller groups, often the most marginalised groups, such as asylum seekers and refugees, that can access adult learning programmes, is crucial and I was pleased to see the community learning and development given a focus in the Scottish Government's New Scots Refugee Integration Strategy 2018 to 2022 and in speaking about adult learning it would be remiss of me not to mention adults in prison given my interest in this area and statistics show that poor literacy and poor numeracy is high in the prison population there are education and learning programmes within the prison system. 
However, we must ensure that CLD is available to those being released. And again, that is about the engagement and it is about preventative spend. And finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, community learning and development is necessary to tackle the problems that are associated with numeracy, literacy, digital access and isolation, but it must be properly resourced. We need an adult learning national strategy that reflects the importance that community learning and development has and the critical role that those working in this sector can play. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Richard Lockhead to close the Government Minister, please. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I firstly begin by congratulating Colin Beattie on securing uh, a discussion on this uh, important subject in Parliament today. And as he said himself when he was speaking, uh, it's the first ever uh, such debate. So it's highly significant. And also, it's the centenary since the seminal report, which uh, recognised the importance of adult education that Colin uh, brought to the attention of the Chamber, uh, taking us back in a journey through the history uh, of this issue back to 1919. So it is very appropriate, again, that we're discussing this, this issue in 2019. Uh, I'm particularly pleased we've had the opportunity to debate the contribution that community-based adult learning does make to Scotland and to hear about the specific impact being made by the partnership between Midlothian Council and Melville Housing that Colin Beatty has brought to our attention. And I also want to thank other members for their insight and their contributions. Uh, Gordon, Gordon Lindhurst, Stuart Stevenson and just Mary Fee you just heard from uh, all discussed, for instance, very topical issues such as digital exclusion, uh, which can lead to social isolation and also lead to people being disadvantaged in our communities if they don't have digital skills in this day and age. And that was a very important dimension I thought was brought to the debate. Uh, in closing the debate, however, I wanted to particularly acknowledge the huge effort that goes into the partnership undertaken by Melville Housing. Uh, as a minister with responsibility for community learning and development, uh, I'm already, over the past few months since taking on this role, seeing the difference that community-based learning is making uh, by working in partnerships uh, across Scotland. Uh, from what I've seen across the country and from what I've heard again tonight, it is becoming increasingly clear to me uh, that Scotland absolutely must recognise the role that community learning development can play alongside early years, schools and colleges, so we can support each other and every one of our children, adults, families and communities to make sure they succeed. And as our society and economy changes, as many members have referred to, we have to ensure that as many adults as possible are engaged in their communities to improve their life chances and to make a contribution that our communities and our economy needs. In 2014, the government quite rightly prioritised young people at a time when Scotland and the rest of Europe were experiencing unprecedented high levels of youth unemployment. In response, at that time, the Scottish Government launched the Development Young Workforce Programme, and we now see youth unemployment at a record low, such that we have achieved our target three years ahead of sh schedule. So whilst we are rightly proud of that achievement, we know that austerity has also impacted upon the delivery of adult learning at a local level, and indeed Mary Fee was referring to that in her uh, speech just a few moments ago. So we now want to respond to that and ensure our approach is fit for purpose moving forward. Uh, Scotland's workforce challenges evolve and as the focus moves increasingly to the upskilling of an ageing population in and out of work, we are committed to supporting adult learning and the role it can play in delivering Scotland's ambitions for inclusive economic growth in this country. It was also in 2014 that the Scottish Government set out its commitment to adult learners through the Statement of Ambition for Adult Learning, recognising it as a central element of personal and community empowerment. And since that time, the Scottish Government is very grateful to the uh, members of the National Strategic Forum for Adult Learning for all of their efforts in uh, safeguarding Scotland's work in adult learning. And their work on the learner voice has ensured that adult learning has been learner-centred and learner-driven. Their commitment has been matched by resources from the Scottish Government, and many members mentioned resources, which has seen over a million pounds per year invested since 2014 in adult learning organisations through our Adult Learning and Empowering Communities funding. I am pleased uh, by the work that these funds have facilitated across a breadth of adult learning organisations, for example, the Scottish Learning Partnership, Leeds Scotland, the Workers' Education Association, and the Coalfields Regeneration Trust, all of which impact directly in places such as Midlothian, represented by Colin Beattie. We want adults to be able to participate in a range of learning opportunities, and in that regard, we're also grateful for the work of other institutions in Scotland organisations, such as New Battle Abbey College, which coincidentally is also situated in Midlothian, 
but which is also working internationally to build Scotland's adult learning reputation through their support for the development of adult achievement awards. And as we address the question of parity of learning pathways, it really is vital that we have a framework to recognise achievement and that this gives us currency for those learners who wish to have their learning recognised by others. Looking ahead, I'm mindful that the strong foundations created by the Statement of Ambition for Adult Learning should now be built upon to create a national strategy to guide this work. As partners work together to develop that strategy, I am clear and must recognise the ways in which adult learning is central to not only personal development, but also to community empowerment, which we've mentioned already. I'll also want to bolster our sector and ensure it's uh, well placed to address the challenges of today and the times ahead. That's why I do want to ensure the forum is supported to lead this work and it is in best shape to engage learners themselves to work together with officials to evaluate progress made and begin the process of identifying our future priorities. We are lucky in Scotland to have a successful Adult Learners Week, uh, which will occur in May 2019, uh, supported by Scotland's Learning Partnership, which is widely recognised across the world as being at the forefront of learner development. It will be important through this year's events uh, and others that we maximise the learners' voices in informing our current activity and our future strategy. In the spirit of Adult Learners Week and one of its themes uh, that we are never too old to learn new tricks, I'm committed to the Scottish Government doing new things in support of adult learning and particularly supporting its greater alignment across other ministerial priorities, in particular within my area, further higher education and science. So I want to also throughout that keep on stressing the importance of partnership as we do deal, out, deal with the fallout and complexity of Brexit. It's an increasingly difficult environment in which we're all operating. These are very challenging times. So we can only combat these challenges by working very closely together. So collaboration will have to be at the heart of the approach moving forward. Like the example set by Midlothian Council and Melville Housing, which so clearly demonstrates how through providing a learning opportunity based on one sh with shared with interests, in this case, cooking, uh, we can easily lead to a, a wide positive outcomes in a whole number of areas. And uh, Gordon Lintars, of course, mentioned the importance of cooking skills, which is a variety of benefits from health to affordability and tackling poverty uh, and so on. So by capitalising all these opportunities uh, that just one skill can offer, such as cooking, partners have shown that uh, adult learning brings life-wide impacts for learners. Uh, there's a lot to do, therefore, in closing. Uh, collaboration and partnership won't be easy, uh, given many of the challenges we do face, but we have to focus on that moving forward. Uh, but overcoming entrenched inequalities while managing the impact of decisions made elsewhere often, especially the consequences of Brexit, will continue to be challenging for years and years to come. But the Scottish Government is committed to doing what it can to reduce the negative impact of all these decisions and won't let them curtail our ambitions or halt Scotland's progress. So I recognise the challenges that many people have mentioned tonight. I am pleased with the progress that is being made and we must take great pride in leading this agenda on behalf of the Scottish Government and I rec recommend the motion to Parliament as we all continue to support adult learning in Scotland uh, and as others have said, congratulate and thank all of those who do contribute towards adult learning in our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting.